I'm Emily Mack. I'm a former keeper of Zoo Knoxville, uh, where I worked with giraffe and zebra. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to the Rasafari Podcast. So, y'all, this week we are going to be exploring, uh, it's kind of, let's call it the sequel to last week's episode. So, you don't have to have heard last week's for this week, but uh, as a reminder, last week we talked to Jamie Delk, who is now at the Dallas Zoo, but we really talked about her journey going from being a zookeeper to leaving the field and then realizing that it was the right place for her, and so returning to it. And this week, we're going to be talking uh, to another former guest, a a friend of the podcast, uh, Emily Mack. And uh, Emily is currently at the Nashville Zoo, but uh, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about the fact that when she was at Zoo Knoxville, Uh, There was a series of tragic losses of animals that she took care of. And, um, you know, this isn't a finger pointing or problematic thing. They are obviously an amazing facility and one that that I love and love having on the podcast and uh, do do a lot with. But um, sometimes things happen. And Emily actually reached out to me and told me that it would mean a lot to her to be able to talk about and share her grief uh, on the podcast with with other keepers and and other people who care about this industry. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about all the good stuff, and that's because there's so much good stuff in this industry. But uh, you know, compassion fatigue is real, y'all. And uh, this is this is a story of of some of that and how hard it is. You're going to hear long pauses. You're going to hear deep breaths. You're going to hear some some crying, and and that's more than okay. That's actually, you know, really important to share. That is part of of this world. So uh, yeah, uh, with all of that said, a quick reminder to make sure that you uh, hit subscribe so you don't miss any of our Tuesday interview or Friday Zoo News episodes. Make sure you're following along on the socials at Ross Safari and on TikTok at Ross Safari Pod. And uh, don't forget that you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Ross Safari. And with all of that said, and with what all of Buzz is saying that I'm guessing you can hear in the background, uh, we're going to get a little bit more serious now and go to my interview interview with Emily Mack. Get ready to get real, y'all. All right, so let's start off uh, by me, by, no, I said that wrong. Wow, it's a good thing I don't put this part in anymore. Tired boy. (laughs) Um, Okay, so let's start off by you telling me uh, who you are. I'm Emily Mack. I'm a former keeper of Zoo Knoxville, uh, where I worked with giraffe and zebra. And while at Zoo Knoxville on the team I worked on, um, we experienced the loss of four zebra in two years. Yeah. Yeah, that's With, tough. Yeah. And that was that was all very um, made very public knowledge. I know we talked about it on Zoo News and everything. Um, and so you actually reached out to me about coming back on and doing an episode, um, specifically to talk about what that experience was like for you and, and, um, kind of as a human, as opposed to as a representative of the facility or anything like that. Um, so I do want to start off by saying that, you know, um, this is not like, this is just a you thing. Right. This is not. Yeah. Um, And I do want to clarify that this is your experience. And I'm excited about it because by by it just being your experience, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean this is universal. People handle things differently, but also um, 
I think it's cool to actually get a look at, like inside the the brain and heart of of one person that went through so much loss at a zoo because obviously compassion fatigue is a big deal in the industry and there's a lot of mental health issues in the industry. Um and so we're going to we're going to kind of talk about all of that. So let's start off um by uh, just a, a quick reminder tell me a little bit about what like your feelings were working at the zoo in general and like you know i know that when you were on before you were you were very happy about all the things and loved the animals so give like a little overview about where you were at before all of this started sure um so i i was really happy at the zoo i i have a previous history of experience with hoofstock especially with equids um so when i came on at zoo knoxville um i stepped into the role of being the primary zebra trainer um uh, when i started working at knoxville uh they had one male and two females who were very fearful of people and with the support of the team i was able to build their trust in people to the point where we were doing uh, training, like voluntary hoof care training. And one of them was fully injection trained. Um, and that's all a very objective way to describe it. But emotionally, um, I they are some of the ones I have built the closest connection with in my zoo career and not just in my zoo career, but as a human being who works with animals. Um, well, and let me, let me pause you there for a second, because like, I think for this to have the impact that you want it to, I want you to go deeper than what you just said. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you built those relationships, mm -hmm. what that felt like to you, what it was like going to work with these zebras every day. Sure. Um, so I may start with a bit of background context and then go deeper just for anyone who isn't familiar with hoofstock. Um, they're prey animals. And even the, even if they have grown up under human care, they still have a very strong flight instinct. And these zebra in particular grew up in a large herd of zebra out in a large pasture setting. So they weren't used to interacting with people up close. Um, so when I first started working with them, anytime a keeper would like go into the hallway near where their barn in their barn or something, they would get scared and leave, which is normal. And I care about any animal I work with. Um, but we went through a journey of building their trust. And since I was the primary zebra trainer, it was mainly me, especially at that beginning stage. And building a relationship with them and seeing them as I use um, like properly timed food rewards and stuff, but seeing their trust grow in me and seeing them choose to stay, even if it was for the food rewards I had, but seeing them choose to stay and seeing their responses to that fear instinct lesson really to me there's a more distant I care about any animal I work with but then there's a closer bond with the ones that choose to actually interact with you and trust you and doing that consistently for years and seeing those animals kind of come out of their shell so to speak and be more comfortable and calm and not just that, but choose to actively come engage with me. Um, there is a very deep emotional love and caring that I felt toward them. And, you know, going to work with them every day was like going to see family every day. Um, and there's always the the angle of these aren't these aren't my animals they're not pets there's always a healthy respect of they're still wild animals but within the context of safely working with them seeing them 
their trust in humans grow, not just in me, but in humans grow. And then we were able using that to do positive reinforcement training in ways that reduce their stress and helped us take better care of them. Um, there's just such a deep connection <laughs> that I built with them. I'm probably going to cry at some point. Just so I okay. figured. <laughs> um, such a deep connection I built with them. And then um, we also had two babies born throughout all of this. Um, and just being able to work with those babies from day one and see that like their curiosity and once they hit weaning age which is about four to five months they start becoming interested in any like solid food you might have which is the way to every zebra's heart apparently <laughs> apparently um, i'm a zebra then i mean apparently i am too <laughs> uh just building the trust with them and when when you're able to do it from when they're babies it creates just that much more of a solid uh, foundation for any relationships further in their life. Um, just, yeah. Um, so that's where I was at before the death started happening. And then that's a big reason why I think it had such a profound effect on me. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that's, um, I think it's very easy for people who listen to the podcast and, and who go to zoos and stuff to understand kind of on a surface level that you have like, a relationship with these animals, but it gets really intense, um, mm -hmm. really quickly. Uh, you know, you're, like you said, you're, you're spending, you know, more time with these animals than, than you often do with, with like your own family and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's, it's very, um, I totally get that. I am, I'm curious just on a kind of, uh, more technical side, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, are zebras free or protected contact? So the ones I worked with, uh, were protected contact. Um, some facilities work them free contact, usually in a setting where they are on an open pasture or a much bigger space than like you might think of when you think of a more traditional zoo exhibit. Um, so within like if you think of a safari park versus a zoo, uh, safari parks have much more space. Um, there's a lot more space for either the humans to move away or the animals to move away. So in that context, um, places do work zebra free contact. But I believe at a lot of even safari parks, if the zebra are in a smaller barn setting, they're work protected contact. So we're not sharing space with them if it's a smaller space, so to speak. Um, but at Knoxville, the ones I worked with, we were always protected contact unless we were doing a procedure where they were under anesthesia. Um, then we went in to trim their feet or whatever. But when they were fully awake, uh, we never shared space with them. Okay. What was the um, barrier situation like? Were you still able to get up close? Were you able to touch or was it like very hands off? So it was like distance space wise um when the zebra were comfortable with it we were able to get pretty close with them like distance wise but again there was always a barrier in between so the way the barriers looked was um in the barn the walls were made of like two by four slats with some gaps in between so we could like throw food or put hay in their feeders and then in the actual keeper doors was heavy duty mesh um, with like two by two openings in it. Okay. And yeah. And um, when I first started working with the zebra, we didn't have what uh, I'm going to call hoof ports, but they were basically windows at hoof level that we could open, um, like had doors covering them that we could open to access the zebra's feet. Uh, but we did get those installed once the zebra got more comfortable with people. So the setup for hoof trimming would look like I might, I would be within a foot of the zebra, but there was a barrier in between. And then there's a door or a window at the bottom that we could open that's less than two feet in height, probably like 18 inches or less, but where we could reach in to access their hooves. 
Uh, but that's only after a lot of training to get them comfortable, training them for the behaviors we need, like putting their feet up on a block and also us being able to read their body language to make sure they're comfortable uh, before we're actually in there handling their feet. And they always have the option to leave. So, right. And that makes yeah. sense. And you you mentioned that y'all actually like adapted the barn a bit as um as they got more comfortable with people which i think is really cool and really shows like i mean that's a lot of work to change Mm -hmm. that kind of thing um but that also shows kind of how long it took to get Mm -hmm. um get them that comfortable with everything so um yeah i think that's that's really cool how long i mean this is such a weird question because emotions and time no it's fine but how long would you say it took you to get um you know the the draft to start uh responding favorably to you like how much time would you say went into this um to get the zebra starting to react favorably to me um for the minimum like okay, you're not running out of the barn, but you're choosing to stay and hang out probably like minimum six months for them to actually start approaching and um, taking food from us. And at Knoxville, we didn't hand feed them like directly from our hands, but we used tongs um, because zebra can still bite. But so if I say hand feed, it's really tong feeding. Um, But for them to actually choose to approach and take food from us probably a year to a year and a half minimum. Yeah. And then from there, like the journey from there to hoof trimming Mm -hmm. is probably at least as long, if not longer, because not only do you need them to approach you, but you need them to come stand close to you while you're doing stuff, like handling their body part, like, their feet and stuff or on for another thing we did for injection training which nobody likes getting shots no but for them to decide that there's enough strong enough relationship with the trainer there's enough trust between you for them to choose to stay even when something aversive like a shot happens um so i worked with these zebra for three to four years um up until the deaths occurred. Uh, so there was a lot of time and consistency that that went into that. Um, it takes a long time to gain hoof stock. Prey animals trust, especially if they haven't had that kind of interaction from when they were born or when they were really young. Okay, that makes sense. And speaking of really young, so when we're talking about all of this stuff, we're talking about the older zebras, but you did mention that two foals were born, or zeblets as I like to call them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, tell me what that experience was like and what it was like being kind of, you know, with them from the start and how you treated foals differently than the adults. Sure. Um, and for some added context for anyone listening, um, I'm I'm primarily talking about like the relationship and interactions between us and the zebra, but we take care of every aspect of their daily lives. Um, We make sure they have a clean living environment. We um, feed them and with, you know, nutritional guidance and decisions from upper management, we um, make sure they have a proper diet and uh, proper nutrients and the amount and all of that, which, and that changes throughout their life as well. Um, we not just, we don't just look at how we interact with them, but how their whole day is structured, what things we put in their environment to try to elicit as many natural behaviors as we can. Like this is definitely a holistic approach in terms of being a zookeeper, taking care of animals. Um, So there's also all of that added emotional involvement, um, even though I'm primarily talking about actually interacting with them. Um, So that includes when there are babies. So up and up to mom giving birth, we're watching to make sure she's getting the proper nutrients. She's able to give birth in a safe place. Um, 
ready to intervene if there's any complications or if mom or baby have any health needs um, or health problems. We're ready to, if we, if we need to step in and provide human care for baby because mom either can't, isn't taking care of them or can't feed them, we have to make sure we have all those supplies. Um, thankfully, we didn't have to do that. Um, the the female who uh, gave birth to both of the babies is named Lydia. So all Lydia's pregnancies went well. Her giving birth went well. She was a good mom. Um, so we're watching with even more, trying to pay even more close attention to all the little details of um, what they're doing and how they're acting when they're, there's an impending birth. And then right after baby's born, making sure baby's healthy and um, we're seeing all the proper behaviors for mom taking care of them and stuff. So just watching them from even before day one, because we're watching mom as she's pregnant and then um, neonates or like brand new babies of any species, um, there's a very high chance of complications or things going wrong. Um, in those first few days. So that's when you're really watching to make sure, like, do we need to intervene? Is everything going well? Which it did. Yeah. Um, yes. And then baby hoof sock definitely feed off of, they feed off of mom and how she responds to the environment. So if mom is nervous around people, baby's more likely to be nervous around people. Right. But I have, I've also seen where mom so Lydia was like somewhat comfortable with us. She would come up to take food and stuff, but she wasn't comfortable enough to do super long training sessions. And obviously when she has a brand new baby, she's focused on the brand new baby. But the baby from the very beginning saw Lydia coming up to interact with us, even if it was just for a few seconds. Um, babies also have kind of an innate curiosity about the world. That's how they learn how to function and play and then, you know, build skills toward being an adult zebra. Um, so one thing I've seen working with multiple equid babies is as they get more comfortable. So this within the first few weeks, they sit very close to mom. And which makes sense. But then as they get older, um, go through the first few months of life, they get more independent. They're out exploring the world more. And some moms are very protective and want baby to stay close to them. Some moms will let baby go off and be a little bit more independent. And that's how Lydia was. And when you hit that like four to five month mark, I was kind of able to like get the baby's attention and hone in their natural curiosity to come up to people before they really built that fear. Nice. That's kind cool. of thing. Um, which was really cool to see. And they obviously had already like the only world they knew was the barn and the exhibit that they grew up in versus the adults. When I started working with them, when they were born, the world they knew was a big open space, a big herd and not really seeing people much. So I think baby, the babies I worked with were already more comfortable and then gaining like kind of hooking in that natural curiosity of when they start eating solid food and like, oh, hey, I have solid food. I have really good food. <laughs> then they see people as a positive and that's when you can really build that trust relationship from as I can't say from day one because from day one, they're nursing from mom and very focused on mom, but as early as possible. Right, right. Um, that really just gives them a good foundation of having positive experiences with people from the very beginning. Um, and definitely saw a difference in those babies in terms of how they were, how comfortable they were with people um, compared to the, how the adults were when I started. And I've seen it happen with multiple babies where if mom, mom's level of comfort actually grows as the baby's more comfortable interesting that, that seems kind of backwards in my brain but i love that it kind of does um but i think and this is having worked with moms that like lydia at this point was not completely terrified of us 
she was comfortable enough right, to right. like stay nearby if we were in the area come up for a few treats and then walk away so she had kind of I guess a mid-level like I I feel okay with you I don't trust you enough or have a strong enough relationship with you to come and do a lot of things with you but I'm at least cool to hang out while you're here and then seeing the baby oh the baby's fine oh I can come up and get stuff or oh what's my baby doing oh this is fine so I think it's kind of the nuance of that was interesting to see if that makes sense yeah no that makes a ton of sense and actually I guess I've been thinking about it while you were saying that and um I I guess it, it makes sense if you think of it like animals do tend to learn from each other and like mm-hmm. a lot of them especially uh herd animals and prey animals of, of which a zebra are both tend to like take cues from one another i know mm-hmm. that um you know even though they are neither herd nor prey animals um cheetahs you know it's the whole dog thing when you give them a dog they will literally yeah. watch the dog for cues and mm-hmm. then will will feel safer so i guess it does make sense from that perspective i'm just thinking of it from the human perspective of like you don't see a whole lot of human parents that are like, oh, my baby feels safe. So yes. I guess I feel safe, too. Yeah. Um, but no, that's actually really cool. So. All right. That was a really nice, really in-depth. Uh, thanks for taking all that time and really explaining the relationship building. I feel like um, we haven't gone quite that deep on it. And that that's pretty cool. Um, and then, like you said, that brings us right to the, the harrowing part, the sad part, when uh, you started to lose zebras and you lost four over two years. Um, do you want to kind of dispassionately recap what happened there so people know? Yeah. Um, so the first one we lost, uh, this may not be quite so dispassionately, but <laughs> I will give the give the timeline as best I can. Fair. Um, the first one we lost was one of the females. So not the female that um, had the babies, but the our other female. Um, her name was Wiley. And we were. Uh, sorry. No, please take your time. We knew this so, would be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So in order to care for the zebra's hooves before they are voluntarily hoof trim trained, which takes a long time, um, in order to care for their hooves, the only way we can do that is to put them under anesthesia. And this is always done under vet vet supervision, um, under the guidance of the vets. Uh, It's definitely not something that is taken lightly, um, but there's always a risk with anesthesia, but the animals do still need care and to have their hooves taken care of. Um, so we were in the process of trying to dart Wiley for an immobilization under anesthesia and she panicked and ran into the fence and injured her neck, um, fatally, unfortunately. Um, sorry. Take your time. And any, any time a death happens in a zoo especially an um an unexpected or accidental one like this um all of the factors of the event and the you know what led up to it um are looked at with a fine tooth comb and it's like what what can we do to prevent this in the future um there's always hindsight is 2020 like it was a horrible accident it's not anyone's fault, but you know, what, what circumstances, if they were different might have prevented it. Um, so we made a lot of changes to how we did immobilizations. Um, I won't go into depth with this, but, I I actually worked on getting the zebra used to so when they're put under anesthesia, we use uh, the vets use a dart gun to deliver the anesthesia drugs. Um, and a lot of prey animals only see the dart gun or the vets under circumstances that are scary or aversive. And that can cause a very um, strong flight response. And that all, like, Wiley was in her very strong flight response when the accident happened and when they're in that very strong flight response, they don't always register that there's a solid barrier in front of them. 
So because we knew we would still need to do future immobilizations to care for the zebra's feet, um, I worked on desensitizing the zebra to the presence of the vets and a dart gun so that they wouldn't, they either wouldn't have a severe flight response or it would severely, um, it would lessen their flight response. Sure. Um, and that was actually very effective over the next few years. So how did you um, work on that? So, so we did a lot of, um, it's called replicating antecedents, which is where animals will connect like the presence of a person or the presence of a dart gun or whatever to whatever in their experience normally follows it. So when they only see the vets or the dart gun in the context of a negative experience, that's why they have a very strong fear reaction. So we worked on replicating those antecedents without having always having the negative experience follow it. Um, so we took a very like baby steps approach to it, but the ultimate goal was to replicate all of the same antecedents of the vets present, the dark guns present, you're in the zebra in the same space that they would be in for an immobilization, but the immobilization doesn't happen. And instead, we used um, their highest value food reinforcers, so their favorite treats, um, to build positive associations with those antecedents being present. Right, right. And that really helped to reduce the zebra's fear response because now they have positive associations with like the vets and the dark gun being present versus something negative always happening. Um, we did still need to do immobilizations with them. So they did still ultimately have some negative experiences with those antecedents, but we were able to do enough instances of the positive experiences outweighing the negatives, which reduced their fear response whenever those antecedents were present. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 That, that, I mean, yeah, it's, I know that's something I've talked to a lot of vets on here and a lot of the ones, especially at smaller facilities where they're able to do this more, uh, really make an effort of going out and hanging out with all the animals and yeah. high value rewards. And like you said, desensitizing them. So um, I've heard, I can't even remember which one of my training gurus said it at some point, but they, they called it like a trust bucket. Mm -hmm. And that like every time you go and you you show up and you don't dart them in this case or whatever, you know, whatever evil veterinary thing you do to help <laughs> save their lives or make yes. their lives better. Yes, um, exactly. you, you put drops in that bucket. And then when you do something that you need to do, it pours out some of those drops, so to speak. But at the end of the day, there's still more drops in there. And you've you've built that relationship. And I I, I like that analogy, although obviously it sounds much better when you use all the proper words like antecedent and such because that is it training is both an art and a science and I, I you know i think that's great no so i really um yeah no that makes a lot of sense i really like that y'all did that um and and i'm I'm sure that had like you said had a great impact you know mm -hmm. yeah um and i think the trust trust bucket analogy is a good way to explain it uh because i'd always rather explain it in a way that's understandable um because there can be a lot of technical technical jargon um oh, yeah. so going back to the timeline um so we lost that's how we lost wiley um and then i'm trying to recall my snippets of time as accurately as i can um but i may not be exactly right like down to the month but about a year later um we lost Lydia under completely different circumstances, but to the same cause of death. Um, she ran into a, a gate on exhibit and injured her fatally. Um, it was not under the context of an immobilization. Um, the zebra were on exhibit and um, they were in an section of the exhibit that was separate from the giraffe and we had just had to have um an ambulance come through um 
due to someone having a medical emergency and just with all the factors surrounding that, um, nobody actually directly saw the impact. So we can't say for sure what spooked her. Um, but there was a lot of activity and stuff, um, in the hour ish, 30 minutes before, um, her death. Um, and then about five months after that, we had our stallion, our breeding male, Tom, or Ditocums is his official name. Um, he developed colic symptoms. So for anyone that doesn't know what colic is, um, especially in equids or horses, it can relate to a lot of different gastrointestinal uh, complications or just things going wrong. Um, so he was showing colic symptoms and symptoms of being uncomfortable and it went downhill pretty fast. Um, we had actually a great vet team and great equine surgeons from, uh, university of Tennessee's, uh, veterinary hospital actually took him into surgery. And unfortunately, when they were able to fully assess the problem, there was nothing they could do. Um, and he uh, didn't wake up. We, they didn't wake him up from the anesthesia. Um, that was, again, we went back and tried to analyze all the factors, but there was nothing we could have done to prevent it. Right. <laughs> um, and he he had been completely fine the day before. Um. And then five months after that, about five months, um, our two, the two foals that were born. So when this happened, um, the older one was about three years old and the younger one was about a year and a half. Um, they were running around in their off exhibit corral and Mosey, the three-year-old hit the barn door and, um, broke his neck um so that's the timeline very dispassionate good job uh, yeah. i kid obviously i'm trying to keep this a little bit light because it no, is you're a podcast, fine. What, you know but whatever you need but, to do no 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 yeah. but i i appreciate all the honesty here and all of the um yeah that is a that's a pretty crappy timeline um and i i have to ask um is this like common in the the you know zoo world and human care in general because i know there have been a lot of stories lately about things like this happening with giraffe too and um i i seem to remember there being some other zebra stories going on at this time outside of of you know your facility um is is this like a common thing with hoofstock in general can this happen with horses like or was this just like the freakiest circumstances um in terms of this many happening in a short amount of time, that is not common. In terms of our hoof stock liable to have freak accidents, run into things, or trip on something and break a leg, yes. Um, that I'm trying to think of the best way to word it. Like, it's not common as in it happens every month somewhere, but it's not uncommon in that it only happens every 10 years, if that right. makes sense. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and unfortunately, with zebra especially, or at least exotic equids, most of the stories you hear about are zebra. Right. Um, the injury of running into something and either breaking their neck or just injuring, like, having enough of an injury to damage their spinal cord it is a common injury or like um cause of death in equids under human care but i don't want to give the wrong impression by saying it's common as in like this happens every other week or every month right um but it is something that we have seen repetitively um in that there's probably at least a handful every year um 
that are lost to this injury and whether it's just because of how they're shaped anatomically combined with an animal that has a very strong flight response. Um, I can't say for sure what the underlying causes are that it is a common injury. Um, I know that there are people trying to gather more data and look at, you know, since these incidents are repeating incidents that keep happening, like, is there a pattern that we just haven't realized and a way that we can mitigate it um, that could be pulled out by looking at this data? So, but hoofstock in general, because they're flighty animals and not all of them grow up in a environment where they get super comfortable with people, this is a response that causes injury with these animals um, fairly commonly. Again, not like every week, every month, but at least a few injuries a year. Um, and ideally we wanna to try to prevent all of them. But to go along with your question about horses, domestic horses also have these things happen to them. <laughs> um, I've talked to several horse owners, like I'm in the horse world myself and you can lose horses from a random colic bout. You can have a horse that has grown up in a field their whole life and they're 20 plus years old and they, for whatever reason, just happen to step wrong and break their leg or they spook and go through a fence and have an injury to their neck. Like wild animals have a strong flight response, but you do also see these accidents with domestic horses. Um, so we want to try to prevent as much as possible, obviously. And I can go into more of this when I talk about my, I guess, emotional reaction to this, but there's always a um, hindsight is 2020 and what could we have done to prevent this? Um, and I want to do everything we can um, but at the end of the day, there is always an aspect, whether wild animal or domestic animal of, we can't wrap them up in bubble wrap and never let them just be a horse, be a zebra. Um, you know, just by letting the animal out on exhibit or out into their field, like we do every day, there's always a chance of a freak accident happening. So it's balancing, keeping them as safe as possible while still letting them be the animal that they are and having the best life that we can give them. Absolutely. And I think that's even a, that's even a debate, you know, people, I think oftentimes people have very strong opinions about that when it comes to zoos, but like, I'll tell you what, Zoe and I even debate the things with our dogs. Mm -hmm. um, Zoe loves to have off leash time, like in safe, you know, environments mm -hmm. and stuff, but like she does things that I would never do. And, and she's a veterinarian and loves her dogs more than anything. And I fully trust that she is doing what is best for them in her mind and stuff. But like, Every once in a while, she'll she'll do something a little off leash or something where I'm like, yeah, yeah. and she's like, well, yeah. I'd rather them be a dog than, and I'm like, I would like to put all of the dogs in a backpack and mm -hmm. never let them get hurt, even if their yeah. paws never touch the ground again. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I'm not usually the uh, the anxious and overcautious one in our relationship, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, no. So I do think I, you know, and I, I mentioned that because I think for people listening, I just kind of want to remind that like. These are genuine debates that have experts and studies done on both sides. And like, you know, there isn't necessarily one right answer mm -hmm. for all of this stuff. Um, and and we talk about that in a lot of different ways on, on the podcast, whether it's, it's how much, um, you know, how much hands-on time red pandas should get. And, mm -hmm. and are they more domesticated if you're too hands-on with them versus are they more real pandas if you don't? Or, but also is the quality of their life better if you do? And you could go on all day. Yeah. And, and really, really good, really passionate people with a lot of science and expertise behind them uh, feel both ways. So mm -hmm. I did just want to take a moment to point that out for those listening, because my guess is there are going to be some people that have a response of like, well, obviously you should do this because we're all yeah. human and we all do that. And we spend too long on the Internet now. So we think that's OK. But really, it's a very um, nuanced uh, discussion that maybe there isn't a quote right answer for, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought I just wanted to mention that, but okay, so let's get to the core of this. Let's talk about 
how Emily dealt with all of this. Yeah. Other than by crying a lot. Which did happen. And still is happening. Yes. Um, <laughs> before I go into my personal reaction to this, because obviously this is my individual story and everyone has their own grief journeys and ways they react to grief. And I'm going to talk about mine and what I found helped me. And I hope that other people, especially other animal care professionals, doesn't necessarily have to be a zookeeper, but any animal care professional who goes through the same kind of journey, I hope that something in my story might help or at least help people feel less alone. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this and talk about this is there's a lot of talk now in the industry, in the zookeeping industry about the importance of mental health and compassion fatigue and all that. Um, when I started as a keeper 10 years ago, that discussion was definitely not happening to the extent that it is today. And I have been lucky in the more recent years of my career to have supportive management and supportive team members that recognize the importance and the very existence of grieving by the people who take care of these animals that die. Um, but especially in the beginning of my career, I encountered the a mindset that unfortunately uh, is still prevalent in some aspects of our industry, which is buck up, get over it, just do your job, don't grieve. There's no validity to you grieving. These are just animals. Um, just a very dismissive and validating. You have other animals to take care of which is true, absolutely. And on the days that we lost the zebra, um, I and our other teammates still on that day needed to, to some, like, to some degree or another, whatever, make sure the other animals had their basic needs provided for. Of course, that is yeah. completely valid. But... Yeah, the um, the mindset I encountered when I was a young keeper, which I think was particularly damaging, especially receiving it at the point of my career where I was a young keeper, was that you shouldn't be attached to these animals. Um, you basically need to hide your grief or pretend it's not there. And again, I think now the conversations are much more open and much more supportive, which is great. Um, but I specifically want to talk about my story with grieving because I don't know that that's always part of the conversation, even about the importance of mental health and compassion fatigue. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> um, so when we first lost Wiley, um, was, I, again, I'm going to actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause you for just one second. Go ahead. Every time you mention Wiley, you melt down 10 times harder than the other ones. <laughs> and and I'm noticing that. So I just want to know, was Wiley like your heart animal? No, actually. Okay. Um, then then yeah. what is it about it? I'm genuinely curious. Like, what is it that is causing you, Wiley is just destroying you every time you, you mention <laughs> mention her and and everyone else like you're you're okay with like you're not okay with obviously the whole point of this podcast you reached out to me to talk about how hard this is and you want to share but what what is it about wiley that you can't get through the name without choking up wiley was the first one okay that's fair um oh my goodness <laughs> see told you yep <laughs> um wiley was the first one and i think Having multiple deaths like this in a short amount of time almost has a compounding effect. Um, so, like, just one would be traumatic enough. 
but I have grief and struggles around each one for reasons like human emotional reasons beyond just what happened that day. And I think Wiley's, I wish that Wiley's was just a a lone incident that happened and was one of the most traumatic low points of my career. But Wiley's death combined with the other three is kind of just, it's, I don't know. Okay, it's no, just a, no, you're fine. Um, it's just a big compounding thing. Right, right. And honestly, that's a good question, and I haven't really thought about it before. So some of this is thinking out loud. Um, but yeah, I think because Wiley was the first, Wiley was the first one, and we thought we had done everything that we could to prevent something like this from happening again. And we lost a zebra to the same cause again, but it was in completely different circumstances. Right. So I, I have, I have still am processing through like losing another zebra to the same kind of freak accident. But when you look at the actual circumstances, it was completely different. So I think it was, it's almost like, thinking back on my memory of what happened with Wiley, like we thought that we had gone through every detail and changed all the things we could to prevent something like that from happening again. And then something like it happened again. So I think that might be where some of my breaking downness is coming. <laughs> um, because there is a feeling of of helplessness around a lot of this. Right. No, I understand that. Yeah. Um and I I will say um if anyone is concerned as they're hearing me talk about this, um Zoo Knoxville uh was great and provided us with grief counselors, free grief counseling. I was so impressed when I saw that. Yes. Um and I am still talking with my grief counselor actually through, but especially in the immediate aftermath of all of these, um, that was a huge help to processing all of this and just getting through what feels like a tidal wave that paralyzes you, especially in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic accident like this. And in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic accident that has already happened to another animal under your care, um, having a professional to talk through all of your feelings and emotions surrounding that is, I think, for me, the key has been the key support in processing through this and getting myself or helping get me through this in a healthy way. Something that I would love to see all zoos do, and I realized that it's not the most likely thing, but it would be really cool, um, would be to bring in grief counselors, like you said, is, yes. is awesome. But actually, uh, even going beyond that, um, so my wife's a vet at a, um, just a, you know, not, not just, it's an amazing place, but this emergency uh, hospital um, for like dogs and cats and stuff, you know. And, um, they have a clinical social worker mm -hmm. as a full time employee mm -hmm. and anyone can go to her with concerns about anything, management, bad nice. patients, yeah. traumatic things that happen with animals like you're talking about. She'll even get on the phone with like patient, well, not patients, you don't call the dogs, but with owners that yeah. are problematic and like talk wow. through things with and mm -hmm. stuff like, you know, that like conflict resolution stuff, that is her entire job. And she's yeah. amazing at it. Yeah. And um, when there have been some, you know, conflicts and Zoe's gone to her, she's been like 10 out of 10 awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 
you know, Zoe wants to get into being like a zoo vet or something. And I, I fully encourage that and, and support her. But uh, one of the things that I think when that happens that will be missed the most is having an actual mental health professional, a, a mm-hmm. social worker, a person who is trained in all of this stuff, mm-hmm. who has an office in the building mm, yeah. and is there just to take care of that. And that is yeah. it's incredible. So these grief counselors, actually, Zoo Knoxville kind of has a unique setup with um, their veterinarians. So they partner with the University of Tennessee uh, Veterinary School uh, for a lot of their services. But one of their services, which is through the school, is a veterinary clinical social work office. Nice. And my interaction with them has all been with bereavement. But they offer that same counseling to their vet students, to the vet staff, to staff at the zoo, um, to clients and who have had, you know, patients who have died or are going through the dying process. Like they have a full department for bereavement services surrounding animal loss. And I'm I'm unsure if they provide services, other services like what you're describing, but um, yeah, we as zookeepers at Zoo Knoxville got, I mean, they still get um, six free sessions with a clinical social worker trained in bereavement. That's sick. I love that. Which is amazing. That is so good. Um, so that, yeah, I, I know not every zoo may be able to provide that level of like service um but some kind of grief counseling to that is low cost or free to their employees um who go through animal losses like this and to be honest not even just animal losses that result in death but animals that are chronically sick or um you know a a hard pregnancy that was very very hoped for and there's a lot of excitement about that the it's then a loss like that kind of thing I think would go a long way toward promoting keeper mental health and keeper morale um yeah yeah 100 percent. all right so back to your experience yes um where was I about to tell us how you dealt with your own grief other than you know um the the very like yeah, the the counseling, yeah. Um so when we lost Wiley, um my experience of that was I as a keeper had previously lost animals. Um like just I believe it was less than a year before that, um our team actually we lost um our bull giraffe June Bay um uh, due to a planned quality of life decision um because his he was 19 which is pretty old for a bull giraffe a male giraffe and his arthritis had gotten to the point where we weren't able to keep him comfortable anymore um with medication or with any really medical intervention that we could do um but that was a very planned out you know heavily discussed process and decision involving vet staff, involving his keeper team, involving um, zoo management after I believe they consulted with other places that have giraffes that have worked with geriatric giraffes. Um, So that was a very planned out and kind of controlled time that was still very sad. Um, But for me, dealing with the freak accidents is a lot harder because of the nature of how unexpected they are. Um, I talk with some keepers who in some ways find it easier to, I guess, process those um, versus the longer drawn out ones because it's not as long and drawn out, which is totally valid. Um, I think for me, it was easier to process through the ones that are more planned and drawn out because I feel like I can say goodbye. Sure. No, that totally makes sense to me. Um, and I can, you know, have the time to spend with them 
knowing what's going to happen, but I feel like I can say goodbye and get closure. But with the sudden ones, especially with a younger animal, um, there's a, it's very hard not feeling like I had the chance to say goodbye. Um, so went through that with Wiley, um, also trying to make sure that the rest of my keeper team was doing okay and felt supported, um, especially for any like younger or newer keepers on the team where that was their first animal death in their career. Um, which is always very hard because you don't know how you're going to need to process it. Um, and then, like I said, going through all the factors surrounding what happened and trying to see what we can do to prevent it kind of thing. Um, so, and again, hindsight's twenty twenty. It wasn't anyone's fault. Um, I definitely have had to process through the feeling of guilt surrounding all of these. Um, a good bit of it I can recognize now as I say irrational, not in a way to invalidate it, but just as a, if I truly look at all the facts, is it anyone's fault? No. Does it feel like it's my fault? Absa, sorry, I'm going to cuss. Absa fucking lutely. Sure. Especially in the, or not even necessarily where I'm like, if I had done this, it would have prevent, but like in an abstract way, I should have been able to prevent this in an abstract way, but also a very deeply emotional, like cutting way. Why couldn't I prevent this? It's my fault that this wasn't prevented. And when you look at all the facts objectively, which is very, very hard to do when you're in the depths of grief, there wasn't anything I could have done to prevent it. But that is a big thing that I struggled with. And until I was able to process through it with counseling is completely paralyzing. Because it's like with, with the animals I'm still taking care of day to day, if I make the wrong decision, is this going to have the same disastrous effect for them? And with what actually happened, no, that is not what happened, but it feels like it. And when you're in the depths of grief, especially if you don't have the mental tools or counseling to help you process through it, it's so hard to talk yourself out of that into a more realistic mindset of if I truly look at all these factors, like, are there things we could do to try to lessen the chances of this happening in the future? Yes. But did this happen as a result of a direct decision somebody made that day? No. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. Um, and it's so also like, it's your responsibility to analyze and try to figure those yes. things out, but also not to, just play the blame game with yourself and like come up with really like, yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, I think even anyone who's ever lost a pet has, yeah. has played that game with themselves of like, well, if I had done this differently, you know, like, yeah, I know the answer is that no, but maybe, but it feels like, yeah. 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 Um, so that's a big, like part of processing through all this. And then I was feeling that like, just after we lost Wiley, so just with one. And then after after we lost Lydia, and while we were in, so the day we lost Lydia, we were in the immediate aftermath of trying to get animals moved around so that we could get out there to her. Um, she was on exhibit with Mosey, who was over a year old at this point, but also with her newest foal, um, who was almost a year old, but still sometimes nursing. So that was Rosie um, watching her try to get her mom to get up. And um, not 
not understanding what had happened to her. Um, and there's obviously no way I can explain that to Rosie. But um, that was really hard. And animals, I'm not saying animals don't grieve because they absolutely do. But thankfully, they live in the present way more than we do. So um, Rosie um, also wasn't alone and was with her her herdmate, Mosey. So she, from what, as best we can tell, went through grieving for a few days and then adapted to you know, what her current circumstances were. Um, but that memory still is very strong for me of watching her confusion. And um, in the days following Lydia's loss, um, Rosie was calling for her and, you know, didn't know as much as she could as a zebra, didn't know why she was gone. Goodness. So that's always hard to watch and empathize with the animals that are left behind. Um, and especially for social animals, because um, I know keepers encounter this, especially with like primates and animals who have very strong social groupings. We do everything we can as keepers to help them through that time, but they do still go through grieving in their own way. Um, so it's hard, not just for me and myself grieving, but also watching these other animals that had a close bond with the one that you lost, watching them go through the grieving process um, in whatever way they as a species do that. Um, that was really hard. And then after Lydia's loss, it was just another additional like, Okay, we tried to do everything we could with Wiley to prevent this from happening again, and then it happened again. What the fuck? First of all, there is that. What? What the fuck? Why did this? You know, like why did this happen? God or the universe or whatever higher spiritual you whatever you want to ascribe it to. Um, there's just that whole level of questioning and how do I reconcile this with honestly like we could go into much deeper spiritual discussions with this but my whole like you know spiritual belief system of like is life fair is it just chaos like blah 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 like you can kind of fall into a deeper questioning of that I think um, especially if there are like compounding losses like this. Um, so, duh, sorry. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Um, Just think you chose to do this. You I approached know. me and we're like, I let did. me cry on your podcast let for an hour. Let me cry on your podcast for whoever's going to listen. Um, but again, I want to, I want to see, share my story in the hopes that it might make someone else feel less alone mm -hmm. and that your grief process is valid. Um, Cause again, I have a very supportive team and, you know, supportive grief counseling and everything. And there are still, there were still moments where I felt very alone. Right. And very just like lost in the deep feeling of loss and, like, what the fuck do I even do now kind of thing. And even if I can't offer someone else an answer for how to navigate that, at least feeling like you're not alone and other people have gone through this and honestly survived it, like, you will be okay. Well, and one of the things that I want to, just from a numbers perspective, you know, um, there aren't really numbers of like how many animals die in zoos every mm -hmm. day or month or year across the country. But, um, you know, I do on zoo news. I, I know, you know, I do my births and my deaths every week and, and my deaths are little obituaries to some of the animals that passed away. Um, each week I get sent probably 20 to 30 deaths. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is all the all the zoos across the country slash world. Uh, we have we have listeners in different places, but mostly the U.S. Um, I get sent 20 to 30 
I wow. usually see an additional 20 to 30 mm -hmm. that I save myself. And zoos don't announce nope. even close to a lot of the deaths because, nope. and I mean, it's not a, it's not a, a hiding thing or a transparency thing. It's just that there are a whole lot of animals that aren't mm -hmm. considered charismatic, that aren't considered, you know, big deals that aren't, you know, every time a jelly passes away, I mean, they just get eaten by their jellies. Like this stuff happens, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I could literally do entire episodes uh hour-long episodes of just what animals that were yeah. popular and well-known enough to be announced for a week died in a week and that's every week always and sometimes i really struggle doing zoo news because of that part and figuring that out and sometimes there are so many that seem to be worth mentioning for whatever reason um that I I get depressed and I will start recording just that part of it and I'll I'll start and I'll do my intro and I'll be happy and I'll do my birds and I'll be happy and then I'll get through the deaths and I'm like I need to get away from this fucking computer and <laughs> um it's actually one reason that I really hate when I have to record very quickly very last minute zoo news because then I just have to plow through that and sometimes it's so damn depressing and every mm -hmm. once in a while I just say, no, I'm only going to do two or three or I even like take a week off from deaths. And honestly, it's it's partially for my my listeners mental health, but it's also for mine. And these are often I mean, you know, yeah, I've met a lot of cool zoo animals and, and sometimes they die and that's part of it. But there are whole weeks where there are none of the animals that I've ever met that are mm -hmm. the ones that died. But man, when you read the, the keeper's take on it and mm -hmm. when you, you picture those relationships that you talked about, it's really sad. Now, the counterpoint to that, of course, is that holy crap, do a lot of humans die every mm -hmm. year and every day? And a lot of these things are natural causes in zoos and in the wild. Oh, my gosh, the wild. Yeah, the wild. The death rates are so higher in the wild. Um, so I, I want to just, you know, again, clarify that for listeners. Yes, lots of animals die, but I think I, I forget. Ah, oh, man, I've had, I've had so many guests on. I forget who said what sometimes. But um, there was this great quote that every animal in your zoo right now will die. Mm -hmm. because everything dies, Do, you know, and, and whether they dies. die at your facility or whether they die 30 years after their life expectancy or whether, you know, they whatever. But every animal that is living at Zoo Knoxville and at every other zoo right now is going to die as is everyone who takes care of them and boy this is bleak but like it's just a reality of life mm -hmm. but i do want to point that out because i do think sometimes you know when you're talking about oh my gosh all these deaths and zoos blah 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 well we have the statistics we know that by and large the animals that live under human care do way better than mm -hmm. their, their wild counterparts and even with these early deaths like i know grevy zebras just off the top of my head live um about 20 years on average in the wild and 30 in mm -hmm. human care so like big difference you know yes but um uh yeah this stuff does happen so i i just i kind of i wanted to point that out um yeah it's it's a huge part of this and we all talk about it a little bit but but i don't think enough even with the the focus on it more now like you're talking about yeah and i do want to um when speaking of numbers um just offer a slightly different angle than what you're saying um you know, like if you think about your local zoo, they have hundreds to thousands of animals there. And I've seen some people comment on social media as social media is like, oh, why is this zoo having so many deaths this year? It is normal in a place that has hundreds to thousands of animals to have some deaths every year. Whether that is animals that are have lived past their life expectancy for their species or two or it, earlier whatever it is it is normal and it is part of part of life as the opposite as that might think but you're right um and I did want to touch on so I've been talking about like the feelings of being in the depths of grief um which is definitely still a struggle and I think a lot of keepers would say is the hardest part of our job. Um, I, I will say for me, I am, I am not happy that the deaths occurred, obviously, but I, being a keeper means so much to me as part of like close to the core of who I am, that I am glad I was able to be there for the, 
I would rather be there than have to not be there for the end of their life. Because taking on the care of an animal and then as much as I'm able, I want to be there for every part of their life while they're under my care. And that includes when they're sick. That includes when happy things happen and they give birth or they, you know, we have another herd member come in. But that also includes when their life ends Sorry. Um, even if that is, even if their life ends because of an unexpected, like, event. And for me, for me, that's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, and the, as much as it hurts, because it really fucking hurts, um, I wouldn't trade the the relationships I had with them and the time I had with them just because the ending was painful. So. (laughs) No, absolutely. I think that's, that's very valid. And like, um, you know, uh, again, my, my biggest thing, I've talked about it on here a lot, but my biggest loss was my dog, Lexi, almost 15 years of my life. My best friend, uh, knew she had a, an issue that was not supposed to be fatal for a while and we're, we're planning on getting it treated. And then pff, one day uh, yeah. she gave me a look and I was like, Oh my God, this is it. And yeah. And, um, it is the single worst memory in my mind. The moment that, uh, we went into that room and said goodbye. And, um, I had promised myself that I would be there, which is hard as a touring musician, but I was. And I had promised myself that uh, I would not let her see me cry. And I kept my eyes fairly clear. Nothing leaked out. There were some tears in them, but she was also pretty stoned by that point. Thanks, doctors. You know, you do great work. It, it really yep. helped. But um, but I, but I, then like when the tech was like, okay, I don't hear a heartbeat, you know, I screamed her name like otherworldly. I did not know I had that in me. I don't think most people do that. I think everyone in the room was a little surprised. I still think of that moment frequently, and that was back in September. Um, But it was such an honor and privilege to be there and to be petting her as she left this world. And yeah, no, it's... um, I, I do think... You know, I think that a lot of people who make the choice to not do that for their pets or or keepers that can't be there for their animals in zoos and stuff uh, do end up regretting it. Uh, with that said, it is also really hard. Yeah, it's it's really hard. And, you know, I can't I can only speak for myself. Um, I I can't say I would. I would not look down on if a keeper chose to take care of themselves and not, not be present. Um, especially if it's, you know, after the animal's been anesthetized and they're not aware that you're there anymore. Um, but it, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard decision either way. Yes. It's a hard experience for anyone going through it. And I, you know, I, I, can't say what the right or wrong answers are for anyone else other than myself. Mm-hmm. And even that is hard to know. Um, I feel like I know it a lot more now having gone through several of them, but um, yeah, it's, it's so hard. And I think because it's so hard and for me, it's a product of me caring so much about them while they're alive, which honestly makes me a better keeper Mm -hmm. and makes me a better animal caretaker. And I think that's why it's so important to have a space where this is acknowledged and talked about and supported. Um, Because it's a product of being a dedicated keeper um, is feeling their loss when, when they're gone. And you know, there's a lot of unhealthy side effects of having to feel like you have to repress your emotions and not having the safe space to process through them. Um, so I, I do like that the conversation around mental health and compassion fatigue is happening 
Um, and there's a lot more support out there for it. And I, I want to help continue that conversation. And especially in the context of grief, because like you said, there's a lot of, there are animal zoo deaths that aren't publicized and aren't talked about. And I've talked to multiple keepers who, depending on how that death is handled on a wider zoo scale, it can feel like it doesn't matter. If you have an animal that you lose, that you were very attached to, that isn't a charismatic megafauna, or not even necessarily saying that their death has to be always announced to the public, but even if you don't get a passing acknowledgement within your zoo community, it feels like it can feel like they don't matter. Right. Um, so one thing past institutions I've been at have done um, after getting feedback from keepers is actually just send out a, like a zoo wide email with about that animal loss and having the keepers write up or add pictures or whatever they want to do. Um, sending out an acknowledgement like that. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be released to the public, um, not because of a lack of transparency or anything, but um, just some acknowledgement from your wider zoo or institutional community. Um, I know has meant a lot to some keepers I've talked to. And it all, it also gives your coworkers outside of your team a chance to offer their condolences and offer support um, in a more kind of officially talked about way. Um, and that is one thing that like having lost Zebra at Zoo Knoxville, I really appreciate the support from other keeper teams and other staff at the zoo. And, you know, we as a team also offered the same, tried to offer the same support to other teams who had lost animals. Um, I think having that sense of community is a really important part of processing through your grief. And again, feeling like you're not alone and feeling like there are people out there, even if you don't have the resource of counseling, which again, I think is very important and every zoo should offer it. But even if you don't have that, feeling like you have a community that supports and understands what you're going through of other animal caretakers um, can be a big thing in helping people not feel alone. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Um, so what else, what else do you want to talk about with your journey to coming out on the other side? Um, trying to think of like the biggest things I wanted to like share and hopefully have people take away. And um, one level of understanding I think I reached that I wouldn't have had without the grief counseling was that, especially after a traumatic, like unexpected death, um, like it's normal. I'm going to say it's normal to not feel anything. And I don't necessarily mean that in the way that it might initially sound like it's normal to feel numb because your body's in shock in the like immediate aftermaths of what has happened because your body's in shock and your mind is trying to protect you from what has just happened. And you will start to feel the grief once your mind and body feel like you're in a safe place to let that happen. And for me, it's always been important to let my, once I'm able to feel that grief, to let myself feel it. Um, it's scary and it hurts and it's, it's debilitating in the moment. Um, but with me personally, I've learned that if I try to repress my feelings, it's just going to come out way worse later. Um, so whatever, like I've always tried to do whatever I need to do in a healthy way, not like a self injurious way to let myself feel those feelings and let it out, whether that's screaming and crying in my car or listening to sad songs that remind me of how like my deep connection with these animals or looking at pictures of them just like and trying to let myself feel these things as it comes up within 
appropriate timing. Like if I'm in the middle of a keeper talk at work and I'm feeling my grief, I do need, at least for me, I need to wait until I can go to the bathroom or go home, you know, at the end of the day, but letting myself feel those things as it comes up and knowing and learning that the grief is always there, but my life will readjust around it. And I've been able to learn how to channel my, those intense feelings back into trying to take the continuing care I'm giving the animals that are still there. Um, but it's not, it's, however you're feeling your grief is not wrong. It's not invalid. It's not, don't let anyone, especially your boss, tell you that you shouldn't be feeling the loss if you are. Because any connection or relationship or feeling of love or caring that you had toward an animal is going to result in some level of grief if they are gone. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Makes all the sense in the world to me. So, yeah, I think that was all my big stuff. <laughs> good, good, good. I am not <laughs> going to um, cheapen this at all with, with our usual endings as much as I, I do enjoy my fun. But mm -hmm. I, I think we're just going to call it there. And um, I want to say thank you for taking the time to... Uh, open up about all of this and to uh, really let your emotions out on the podcast. I really do yeah. appreciate it. I think it's a really good look at, uh, you know, what that experience is like. I did want to highlight um, one organization. Um, oh, yeah. No, please. That it's, it, they provide mental health care for zoo and aquarium professionals um, called Grays. It stands for Growing Resiliency for Aquarium and Zoo Employees. Um, but they provide programming on mental health. They provide support services and they provide crisis response um, for keepers and other animal care professionals that are struggling with mental health related um, issues. So I, I did want to shout them out for the great work they do and encourage anyone who listens to this and feels like they need support or wants to bring in programming for their facility. Um, Gray's is definitely an organization worth looking into. And it was founded actually by former zookeepers who saw the need for something like this in the, in that field. So. Very cool. That is uh, that is a great organization. Yeah, that's very cool. Awesome. Thank you again so much for uh, taking the time and, and being so uh, vulnerable. Yeah. Thanks for um, letting me talk about it. Yep. All right. So there you have it. Uh, I want to thank Emily um, for, you know, just being so open and transparent and for wanting to share her story and her experience with y'all. Um, it's It means a lot to me to be able to be that person for her and to, to be the the uh, the place where that sharing can happen. And hopefully um, this either gives you a bigger appreciation of what happens in the zoo field, or if you are one of my listeners that is in the zoo field, uh, that, you know, it, it helps you connect and realize that maybe, you know, you're not alone if that's how you feel or, or whatever. I just, I hope it was a good experience for all of you. Um, cause it really did mean a lot to me to be a part of it. Uh, so yeah, thank you again, Emily, for sharing all of that. And while I'm on my thanks train, I might as well say thank you to Dr. Lara Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, Jenny Owens, and Kevin Williams, my red panda level patrons. Thank you all for your support. Don't forget that we will be back here on Friday with a new episode of Zoo News. And uh, until then, the only thing I have left to say is to remind you that the word credits backwards is Steiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. 
Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.